Hey all, Baruch Levy B here from The Defiant Spirit. Thanks for tuning in. I want to share with you some thoughts after a high school reunion, which I did already part one on that, which is bearing witness and how important it is to be seen. So you can listen to that one, but this one's different and I'm not really gonna talk about the uh, reunion so much as what it, I don't know, instigated in me. Before we do, I wanna share with you a poem. If you haven't heard this poem, um, you can Google it. Just Google The Invitation by Oriah Mountain Dreamer. It's a little bit long. I know she's very um, protective of this from a copyright per perspective, so I don't want to violate that, but I'm not putting it in print, so you can just Google it. I'll just read it. <coughs> now, remember, or remember, know that she wrote this after, or at least as the legend has it, after going to a cocktail party or coming home from the bar. It doesn't interest me what you do for a living. I want to know what you ache for, and if you dare to dream of meeting your heart's longing. It doesn't interest me how old you are. I want to know if you will risk looking like a fool for love, for your dream, for the adventure of being alive. It doesn't interest me what planets are squaring your moon. I want to know if you have touched the center of your own sorrow, if you've been opened by life's betrayals or have become shriveled and closed from fear of further pain. I want to know if you can sit with pain, mine or your own, without moving to hide it or fade it or fix it. I want to know if you can be with joy, mine or your own, if you can dance with wildness and let the ecstasy fill you to the tips of your t fingers and toes without cautioning us to be careful, be realistic. Remember the limitations of being human. It doesn't interest me if the story you are telling me is true. I want to know if you can disappoint another to be true to yourself. If you can bear the accusation of betrayal and not betray your own soul. If you can be faithless and therefore trustworthy. I want to know if you can see beauty even when it's not pretty every day. And if you can source your own life from its presence. I want to know if you can live with failure, yours or mine, and still stand at the edge of the lake and shout to the silver of the moon, yes. It doesn't interest me to know where you live or how much money you have. I want to know if you can get up after the night of grief and despair, weary and bruised to the bone and do what it needs to be done to feed the children. It doesn't interest me who you know or how you came to be here. I want to know if you will stand in the center of the fire with me and not shrink back. It doesn't interest me where or with, uh, with whom or what you have studied. I want to know what sustains you from the inside when all else fails and falls away. I want to know if you can be alone with yourself and if you truly like the company you keep in the empty moments. So I went to my, well, technically it was my 30th, but I think it was a 32 or 3 because I missed it in COVID. Um, first time I've gone back. And as I mentioned in the last one, I, I had skipped, I think, because of this poem for the past 30 years. I went off into the world to do my own thing and to do some of the shadow side of this stuff because it did interest me where I went to school, how many degrees I could get, how much money I can make, how much influence I can have, blah, blah, blah. And I just assumed, and probably rightly so, that most of my contemporaries would come back and it would just be a pissing match, you know, to see who's done what and who hasn't done what. And I don't know if I articulated that to myself, but I do think that's in the back of at least a lot of our minds when we go to these things. But what was so amazing to me is that everybody at this um, reunion was north of 50 by definition unless you were like Doogie Hauser, I guess, uh, and graduated, you know, at 10, whatever, you are going to be north of 50. And I, I do believe that north of 40, but now I think in this day, day and age, north of 45 or 50 is really the, the number, things change. And this, this poem becomes not only meaningful, but defining. You know, it's interesting if you're a guy, I think this is true in general, but I know it's true with guys especially. You introduce yourself and say, hey, my name is so-and-so, and I had to do that because I had a different name tag on, and uh, I look pretty different. And um, after you exchange the pleasantries, you know, where do you live and whatever, what's one of the first things that you ask? What do you do, right? Not even usually what do you do for a living, but what do you do? And 99.9% .9 of the time, if you stick your hand out and you say that, I think in this day and age, probably to women too, but exclusively men will say, I fill in the blank. And what they fill in the blank with is their job because it's who I am. It's what I do. I did a podcast a few weeks ago on, it's called the afternoon of life, the morning of life. Morning of life, first half of life is you are what you do. And going to this reunion, 
I guess I was just assuming we're all still in the morning of life, but it was really amazing because I didn't have many morning of life conversations. What do you do? How much, how much money do you make? I'm asking you that without actually asking you that. You know, you're telling me that without actually telling me that. We're dancing around the accomplishments or dealing with them outright. Um, we're not even talking about whether you have kids or not. We're not talking about, uh, well, you know, what this, this poem is getting to, which is, I don't give a shit what you do for a living. I don't care if you bag groceries at Walmart or if you're the CFO at Walmart, right? If you can't look me in the eyes, I don't really want to talk to you. If you can't have a conversation about something other than your vocation, I don't really want to have a conversation. If you can't fill in the blank of what you do with about 10 to 20 interesting things, I don't really want to have a conversation because I get what or Orion Mountain Dreamer is saying. And, and again, my, my experience having gone back was most of the people I talked to, we talked about what interests them. We talked about what scares them. We talked about what they aspire to, what, you know, age has done to their life's journey. And, you know, not all the people I talked to and not all the conversations were, were deep and sophisticated, but many of them were. And it just reminded me that you get to the afternoon of life. Again, you fill in what that means. To me, it's like 45 upwards. Um, you get to the afternoon of life and there are those who do and those who don't want to be in the afternoon of life. If you don't want to be in the afternoon of life, it can be a brutal journey because, um, you know, back to the Carl Jung quote, if you remember it, it based, I'm going to just summarize it. You can go back and listen to part one. I actually didn't mean for this to become part two, but I see that the conversation is all bound up in this afternoon of life experience that I had at the, um, at the reunion. But Carl Jung is the one who coined, there's a morning of life and an afternoon of life. Both have their places, but both are made up of different rules. Nobody teaches us this, he says in his quote. Nobody tells us that this is happening, but just know it's a universal truth that what works in the morning not only doesn't work in the afternoon, it fails you in the afternoon. So some of those morning of life rules, you are what you do, you are what you have, you are the flesh suit, the way you look. That is true in the morning of life to a degree, at least we perceive it to be true. The problem is, if it's true in the afternoon, my friends, you're screwed because the flesh suit just gets fleshier and the doing just slows down. And I don't care how much money you have in the bank. It doesn't take away the journey of putting the money in the bank, meaning when I work with people who have a lot of money in the bank because they had successful professions and now they're in retirement, what they're struggling with is not having the profession anymore. The money was just a byproduct of the climb, of the journey, of their profession and their success and their accomplishments and their, the, the, their being central to people's lives. Nothing wrong with that. Absolutely great. But that is a morning of life pursuit because in the afternoon, certainly in late afternoon, definitely in evening, I don't like to put numbers on those, but you know what they are. If that is your goal, if those are your rules, if that's how you occupy your time, you're screwed because the phone will stop ringing. I don't care if you're a rabbi, trust me, I know this, or a priest or a minister, or a judge or a doctor or CEO. The moment you retire or Shortly thereafter, the phone will stop ringing. People will stop needing you. They'll stop coming around. It doesn't mean you don't have some friends. It doesn't mean you don't have some ties. But over and over, I've experienced it and I've coached through it that it is a challenge to one's identity when they have spent it in the morning of life, even in the afternoon of life, professionally defining themselves. Hi, I'm Baruch. 
what do you do for, you know, what do you do? And you fill in the blank, well, I'm a lawyer. When you're not a lawyer, what are you? Who are you? What, what, what is your life about if you're not lawyering or doctoring? Now, it doesn't mean you can't be a lawyer or doctor and have a healthy relationship to your title. It just takes work. Um, it can be done, but it doesn't come easily. You have to stand guard against getting sucked into, I am the profession, I am the role, I am the relationship, I am the things, I am the activities. Because in the afternoon of life, all of those things slow down and eventually fade away. And if you haven't developed an alternative identity system, you're screwed. I was just in Omaha, where the reunion took place, and I went to visit my stepfather, who's in the um, nursing home. He's not doing well, he's struggling, and I don't know how much longer he has here, but like all of us, his time is limited. His is, I think, particularly limited. And um, walking through that nursing home was a reminder that we all are reduced to the corner of a nursing home bedroom in a wheelchair, or even if you stay at home, right? Your world goes from the accumulation of a house and maybe houses and things, and it just gets bigger and bigger. Kids leave, and then there's like a diminishing, and there's a downsizing, and then you go to the condo, and then you go to the um, assisted living, and then you go to the nursing home, and then you go to the hospice, and it's just it's a smaller reduction process process. It doesn't have to be. This isn't depressing. Because if you focus on deeper things, things like core values, things like your beliefs, philosophies, your ideas, um, articulating them, refining them, developing them, practicing different types of practices, Tai Chi and mindfulness meditation, prayer, whatever these things are, these are with you. Right? And I saw the people in the nursing home. I only saw the ones who didn't. Maybe there were some who did have these things. But parked them in front of the TV set. And came back six hours later, still in front of the TV set. Um, I don't know. Maybe internally they were reciting their personal mission statement, which is what I do. I, I hope I have the faculties to do that at 70, 80, 90, whenever my time to transition into that space is. Um, I've shared it before. I'm not going to share it right now, but I have about a three paragraph recitation that I just recite morning, afternoon, and evening. Um, I recite it when I go to bed and when I wake up. I recite it when I'm sick. I'd like to think, God forbid, if I have ALS and my body shuts down and my mind is working and I can't communicate, I'll just recite that. Or I'll think about the Enneagram and different pathways and combinations and permutations, you know, eight plus one equals nine. And if you look at the Enneagram eight and the Enneagram one, they have a lot in common. And in some ways they complete each other. So there's mathematics around it, blah, blah, blah. That's just my shtick. What's yours? The afternoon of life is about not going outward, but going inward. Can I develop the stuff that can't be taken away from me, that nobody no circumstance can strip from me because that to me is the litmus test. The afternoon of life has to be about attaching ourselves to those things that are actually things, to those pursuits, to those experiences. Can you um, expand your identity? Can you become a painter if you were a lawyer? And now, and it doesn't have to be, by the way, in retirement. I mean, Afternoon of life doesn't mean you're retired. It might be, but it also, and, and I'm not supposed to use the word retirement. I hate it. I've railed against it. Reinspirement, come up with a better word. But you can do this at any point. I'd like to say you could do it prior to the afternoon of life. I don't think you can. Yeah, you can have a hobby. I'm not talking about hobbies. I'm not talking about painting as a hobby to keep you busy. I'm talking about expressing yourself. And don't give me the bullshit. I, I can't draw. Of course you can draw. Maybe you can't draw hobby, you know, why is going to a class to feel good to compete, you know, putting it up um, for the competition or something, but that's not art. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, this is between you, yourself, and your creator, picking up a paintbrush and expressing yourself on canvas. Um, 
a thousand things. Picking up books that expand your horizon, expand your directions, right? No longer just reading to uh, escape. Nothing wrong with that. Certainly not just watching Netflix to escape. Again, within moderation, nothing wrong with that. But can I expand my identity? Can I challenge my identity? What does it mean that you're not an artist? What does it mean that you're not a dancer? What does it mean? Who says who? Where did this is morning of life crap? Where people around you, society around you, you are telling you all the things you can't do, putting you in the boxes, sticking you with the labels. Says who? Morning of life is all about what they say. It's all about what other people want and need from us. And again, rightly so. We have dependence in particularly in the morning of life, probably in the afternoon of life, but certainly in the morning of life. We have responsibilities. We have all kinds of things that keep us caged, contained, at the very least. The afternoon of life is about removing the containers. Now, natural containers and cages are going to come. Your body is a prison. It, it will condemn you uh, over time. Don't think it won't. If you're just trying to fight off the prison of the body. Good luck with that. Let me know how it works out. Maybe you can prop it up. Maybe you can keep it looking like it did in the morning of life for a period of time. Just look at Madonna, by the way, if you want to see that's not possible. It kills me every time I see her thinking that that's the def and that, they, that is the definition of morning of life in the afternoon. Trying to live by the morning of life rules. I don't know much about her, so I really don't want to critique her too hard, but I can only tell you what I see. And what I see is a woman who has not gone inward. She's gone outward. And she's trying to play by the same rules in the same game in the afternoon. But what worked in the morning will fail you in the afternoon. And so I don't care who you are, how successful you are, how beautiful you are. In some ways, that's even harder because the morning of life rewarded you for each of those things and more. And it's hard to let them go. But the afternoon of life is about letting them go proactively before life takes them from you. Great teaching in the Talmud. Every baby comes out fists clenched, screaming, holding on tight. Every corpse leaves, leaves this world with their palms open, their hands open. You will not see a corpse naturally with their hands squeezed tight. The work of our lifetime, says the Talmud, is to learn how to open your hands before life opens them for you. Can you, in the afternoon of life, learn how to describe yourself at those reunions with other people, with new identities, with new expanded versions of you, dropping the history of the past? You know, that was another thing at the reunion. It's easy to just get caught up in talking about a past. But for the guys that I really reconnected with, you know, you know who you are, um, it wasn't just about the past. It was also about the present, and it was about the future. It was about the present and you know, the reality of what they're living in, what they're going through. It was about the future of hopes and dreams. That's the test of it's really a, if, it's, if it's a real relationship or if this is just nostalgia. This is just fumes, right? Cut flower syndrome, living off of the past. And it you know, died a long time ago, and we're just not admitting it. But, and some of those were true. I went back. There was just nothing to talk about once you run out of the memories. But again, a couple of those guys, it wasn't that. It was about going deeper, expanded identities, not just getting stuck in my role. You know, we do that. We all do that with certain people. We go back and play out these roles and surrounding yourself in the afternoon of life with people who will let you play expanded roles, who encourage it, who welcome it, who don't say, you don't do that. You don't dance. You don't cook. You... You aren't a detail-oriented person. You, you don't fill in the blank. Right? That's the point. The afternoon of life has no rules except the ones that you decide. That's one of the hallmarks of the afternoon. Expanded, greater freedom. Morning of life is about conforming to people around us, to our society, to all these expectations. Afternoon of life is supposed to be about rebelling defying, challenging, pioneering, new, novel situations, not <coughs> to stay busy like the morning of life, but to 
expand who we are, challenge our identity, and be able to come back to this Oriah Mountain Dreamer um, poem to touch on all of these things, right? To be able to go through life and having had your ass handed to you and standing up again and saying yes, not having been shut down by loss. I love being around people who have lost loved ones and are, as I say, loving more fiercely and living more fully. Not in spite of the loss, because of it. They have doubled down on life versus the people who have lost and have said no to life, have shut down. No judgment. I just don't really want to hang because it's not expansive. The whole point of life is to expand, is to grow. Part of that is moving through challenge. That's a necessary part of growth. It's also the beauty of the afternoon of life. You can escape the morning of life without the growth. You can't escape the afternoon without at least opportunities to grow, challenges, setbacks, failures. How many people I talked to at the reunion who've gone through divorce? Now, some of them were shut down because of it and probably will be forever. But some of them are in another relationship and loving fiercely because they know what it was like to be on the other side of that. So this is the afternoon of life. These are the opportunities. Can I defy the, the morning of life rules, create my own rules, right? Determine my own why and stop living other people's and answer these, these challenging, I don't know, questions, but challenges from Oriah Mountain Dreamer. Don't care how much money you have in the bank. I don't care what you did in the past. Who are you now? What do you stand for now? What do you want to accomplish in the future? Whether it's a day or whether it's 30 more years. What are you about? And that's really what this is about. Rewriting the rules for the afternoon of life, becoming an expanded version of ourselves and not just in the waistline, expanded versions of our identities, changing, dropping old pieces of us, shedding them like dead skin, not living bound, chained to the past, chained to other people's expectations. Can I break free? And what I saw at that reunion is yes and no. Some people do, some people don't. What I would argue is it's not luck. It's not happenstance. It comes down to what Viktor Frankl talks about, attitude. Um, this is the last of human freedoms. To choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way, you aren't going to be able to choose your circumstances. I think when we all set out before that um, reunion 30 years earlier, Every one of us was an arrogant morning of lifer who said, I'm going to create my own reality. And then life kicks you in the ass and you realize you're not creating your circumstances. You're either reacting or you're responding. And mostly in the morning of life, for me at least, it was reacting. But in the afternoon of life, certainly moving into mid-afternoon, it's much more about response, response able, able to choose my response. And that's my challenge to you. And that's the work that I do with people in a nutshell, help them learn the new rules that they want for themselves, the new goals, goals that they set for themselves, the new way of being in this afternoon of life so that they can ultimately live their true self, drop all those false selves, all those versions and variations, not run from them, not be ashamed of them, not regret having worn the mask, but now choosing whether or not they still want to wear that mask, they want to try on different masks, or maybe live with no mask at all. So that's the work of the afternoon of life. That's this podcast. And if you didn't hear the first one, uh, part one, you can find it a couple episodes ago. Until the next podcast, defy your number, live your spirit, jump over to defiantspirit.org, and I'll talk to you next time.